Hey everybody. Today we're covering the basics of probability. We're talking about sample spaces, outcomes, events, and so forth. A probability experiment or random experiment is a trial for which the outcome can't be predicted with certainty. Although if you run the trial over and over and over again, certain trends may emerge. Here's a few examples. Flip a coin and record whether the result is a head or a tail. Use a random dialer to collect, contact 10 random voters and ask whom they intend to vote for. Roll two dice and record the sum. Roll two dice and count the number of sixes. By the way, notice in, this last, in these last two cases, we're doing the same action, but the data that we're recording is slightly different. So we have different probability experiments. A little bit more vocabulary. The result of a particular trial of a probability experiment is called the outcome. The collection of all possible outcomes of a probability experiment is called the sample space or outcome space, usually denoted with a capital S. And um, a subset of the sample space is called an event. I think this all makes more sense when we do an example. So here we go. Let's flip two coins and just record the results. The sample space consists of four outcomes. Heads, 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 tails, tails, heads, and tails, tails. If we let E be the event, both flips are the same, then we have two outcomes in that event. Heads, heads, tails, tails. This is a subset of the sample space. Roughly speaking, an event is something that can happen when you run the probability experiment. But there may be multiple different ways that it can happen. As in this last example, the event, both flips are the same, can happen two different ways. If you have an event that can only happen one way, in other words, the event consists of a single outcome, we call that a simple event. The complement of an event, E, usually denoted E prime, sometimes E with the bar over it, is the set of all outcomes in the sample space that aren't in E. So if E occurs, then E prime does not occur, and if E prime occurs, then E does not. For instance, suppose we use a spinner to randomly select an integer from 1 to 9, and let E be the event, the result is a prime number. Here's the sample space, it's just the integers from 1 to 9, and here's the event E written as a set. It's all the prime numbers that are less than 10, 2, 3, 5, and 7. So the complement of E, E prime, is going to be the event that E does not occur. So written as a set, it's going to be all the numbers less than 10 that are not prime. 1, 4, 6, 8, and 9. Two events are disjoint if they don't have any outcomes in common. To say it differently, if they can't both occur. For example, flip four coins and record the results. And let E be the event, the first two flips are heads. And F, there are at least three tails. So the probability experiment has a sample space that consists of 16 possible outcomes. Things like heads, 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 and heads, 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 tails. E and F can be written as follows. E, the event the first two flips are heads, has four outcomes in that event. Things like heads, 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 and heads, 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 heads tails. And F at least that there are at least three tails can be written like this. Here we have five outcomes. Four where we have three tails and a fifth where we have four tails. Notice that there's no overlap between these two sets. There's no outcome that lies in both of the sets. These are disjoint. To say it in words, it's impossible for both of these events to happen at the same time in one trial of this probability experiment. Now, there are actually several different ways of describing the probability of an event, um, all of which we're responsible for. First is empirical probability, or statistical probability. And that's probability just based on observation. Basically, we run a probability experiment over and over and over again. We count the number of times that the event occurs and divide by the total number of times we ran the the ran, that we ran the probability experiment. This is just going to correspond to the proportion of times the event has occurred in the past. For instance, 
If we flip a coin 100 times and it comes up heads 53 times, the empirical probability of the coin coming up heads is 53 and 100, or 53%. If a poll of seven in a now suppose we do a poll of seventy <laughs> of seven hundred and fifty randomly selected pet owners, if four hundred and twelve of them prefer dogs to cats, then the empirical probability that a pet owner prefers dogs to cats is four hundred and twelve divided by seven hundred and fifty, about fifty four point nine percent. A different way of computing probability is classical probability also known as theoretical probability. And this only applies when all of the outcomes in the sample space are equally likely. And in that case, we count the number of outcomes in the event, count the number of outcomes in the sample space, and divide to get the probability. To say this a little more technically, we're doing the cardinality of the set E divided by the cardinality of the set S. So cardinality just means the number of um, elements in that set. Um, here's the notation, sort of absolute value of E divided by absolute value of S, and that just means number of outcomes in each. A couple of examples. Roll a fair die. You've got six possible outcomes, all equally likely. If we're looking at the simple event E um, of getting a five on that single roll, there's one outcome in that event, so the classical probability is going to be one in six. If we flip a fair coin three times, we have eight possible outcomes listed here, all of them equally likely. Let's let E be the event that we get exactly two heads. There's three outcomes in that event, heads, heads, tails, heads, tails, heads, and tails, heads, heads. So the classical probability of the event E is going to be three divided by eight. There's three equally likely ways of getting exactly two heads out of eight equally likely outcomes possible in total. Let's run through an example. Here we have a frequency distribution for an introductory statistics class at a large university. 67 freshmen, 72 sophomores, and so on. What's the probability that we randomly select a person from this class and get a sophomore? This is a classical probability question. There are 222 outcomes total. 222 students in the class, and uh, 72 um, outcomes that are in the event that we're interested in, that we get a sophomore when we select the person at random. So the probability of randomly selecting a sophomore is 72 divided by 222, about 32.4%. Let's stick with the same frequency distribution and ask a slightly different question. What's the probability that the next person who registers for the for the course will be either a junior or a senior. This time we're asking for empirical probability. We have data about students that have already registered, but we're interested in um, the next person who will register. We can't know with certainty what that probability will be. Um, however, the calculation is going to be basically the same. We're going to compute the number of students that have already registered that are juniors or seniors so 29 plus 54, and divide by the total number of students that have already registered to get 37.7%. Although the computation is the same, the philosophy behind it is a little different. This time, our probability calculation is based on observation, so it's empirical probability, not classical. Regardless of whether we're talking about empirical or classical probability, a few facts are always going to be consistent. First of all, for any event, the probability is going to be between 0 and 1. 0 is going to be um, an impossible event, and 1 is going to be a certain event. If S is the sample space, then the probability of S occurring is 1. <laughs> Something is going to happen when you run a probability experiment. If E and F are disjoint events with no outcomes in common, then the probability of at least one of them occurring is the sum of the probabilities that each one will occur. And the probability of them both occurring, of course, is going to be zero by the definition of disjoint. Additionally, if we have complementary events, then the sum of the probabilities is going to be one. One of the two things is going to occur. To say that slightly differently, the probability that event 
that event E does not occur is 1 minus the probability that event E does occur. In our everyday lives, we frequently use the language of probability very loosely, just estimating the chances that something will happen based on intuition and general life experience. In statistics, we call that subjective probability. For instance, I might say, I'm 99% that I'll win, I'm 99% certain that I'll win this game. Or, there's a 50-50 chance that my phone will die today. While statements like this are descriptive and useful in our regular lives, they don't have mathematical meaning, and we don't want to base statistical calculations on them. Um, the, this sort of subjective probability is not really the subject of statistics, um, the study of statistics.